The next case on our docket is 22-60067, Moore Watson v. Rankin County Public School District. Mr. Miller. Good morning, Your Honors, and may it please the Court. I'm Julian D. Miller on behalf of the appellant across the appellee, Tamitha Moore Watson. Because the Rankin County School District violated my client's right to a free and appropriate public education and violated child fine by failing to provide a comprehensive re-evaluation for dyslexia, failing to provide a comprehensive re-evaluation for dyslexia after a failed dyslexia screener and an independent evaluation diagnosing him with my dyslexia, as well as failing to make any changes to his IEP despite his below grade level academic performance, this Court must reverse the District Court's erroneous ruling denying compensatory educational services in the form of reimbursement for private school tuition for the minor child's attendance in New Summit. He's entitled to this relief for three reasons. First, Your Honor, and let me be very clear, the District Court erred as a matter of law with its reliance on an outdated 1985 U.S. Supreme Court case that predated the 2004 amendments to IDEA. The current Fifth Circuit jurisprudence is clear. Compensatory awards should place children in the position that they would have been in but for the violation of IDEA. The District Court's order to place the child back in Rankin County School District and to provide the IEP services for dyslexia doesn't recompense for the time that the District failed to first evaluate him, that the District failed first to evaluate him following the failed dyslexia screener in kindergarten until he failed second grade and had to train. If we were to simply affirm, what would happen to M.W.? Your Honor, if the Court were simply to affirm the ruling, right now he's no longer in the Rankin County School District. Thanks to the services he received, dyslexia services he received at New Summit, he was able to make improvement with his dyslexia. And so what we're saying, Your Honor, is based on this Fifth Circuit jurisprudence, in order for him to be recompensed, the parent, Ms. Watson, should be reimbursed for what she paid out of pocket to New Summit for him to actually receive the dyslexia services. There's a dispute about whether the New Summit was kind of the right place to go, even assuming arguendo all the other things in your favor. Your Honor, we take the position, of course, that the New Summit was the appropriate placement. I know, but the District Court found otherwise. Well, Your Honor, the District Court was wrong on two levels. First, Your Honor, based upon the Fifth Circuit jurisprudence that I cited in my brief Spring Branch, the Houston Independent Schools case in Draper, because the child was placed in a specialized school that was geared toward his disability, the courts have found that to be an appropriate placement. That's analogous to this case. Your Honor, remember, based upon the facts of the case, this child received zero services in the District for dyslexia. He did not even receive an evaluation. He failed the dyslexia screener in kindergarten. I mean, you agree that even if the public school is doing a bad job, if the parents move the child to a private school, it still has to be a proper and good private school, not just one that says it's good. Oh, no, but Your Honor, it was a proper and good. Okay, but the District Court found otherwise. The District Court, Your Honor, looked at the self-serving testimony of the school district representatives, and particularly Ms. Bullock. And, Your Honor, I want to note, this is record of appeal, page 768. The SPED director, Ms. Bullock, had testified, you know, she was making testimony about, oh, this was this issue with the new summit, there was that issue. But she then testified that, and admitted, she did not have any observations of the minor child within the new summit district. She was talking about previous experiences. She, nor any of the district reps that testified, ever observed this child in new summit. The teachers, the dyslexia therapists, and most importantly, Ms. Watson, gave clear testimony about the educational benefit that this child received during his experiences in new summit. 
That is what the law is, and that's what the facts demonstrate. The district court wrongfully relied on the self-serving testimony of district representatives who had no experience at that point about what this child's educational benefit, what his growth, and all those things, even though the record was clear from the teachers who taught him, from his mom and from the dyslexic therapist, that he actually was improving. He was able to read better and doing better academically. So the court was wrong factually, but again, Your Honor, it was legally wrong because it based upon that 1985 Supreme Court case that at the time had language that said there was a preference to keep a child in public school. But again, Your Honor, and like I said, with Draper's case, which I cited, the district court's compensatory award must, quote, be reasonably calculated to provide educational benefits that likely would have accrued from special education services the school district should have applied in the first place. Because the district, as a matter of their own policy, Your Honor, let's not forget, this court excoriated the district for its policy, it's, it's, uh, it's, it's policy that essentially said that if you are a child with an IEP already, you cannot receive dyslexia services. So my client at the time had an IEP for listening and speech impairment. So as a matter of the district's policies, he was excluded from receiving services, let alone well, refusing to evaluate him after uh, the mom got an independent evaluation that clearly demonstrated that he had dyslexia. So in order for him to actually receive a, a, a compensatory award, uh, uh, um, the, the, the district has to recompense mom for taking the steps to place him where he placed him in New Summit, where he got accommodations for dyslexia, where he got dyslexia therapy, where he got uh, 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 classroom instruction uh, that helped him improve academically. So again, we take the position that um, from a factual standpoint, it, it, was, the, it was the appropriate placement. And from a legal standpoint, as the law states, as the precedent uh, jurisprudence I cite in the brief states, um, he was uh, entitled to uh, private school tuition reimbursement. Also, Your Honor, to make note, and one other issue that the, uh, the district court raised, um, he considered the testimony, again, the self-serving testimony from the district witnesses that um, the, the um, instructors at New Summit did not have state certification. Well, again, the federal law is clear, but also state board policy, Rule 74.9, Section 300.148C, which I cite in the brief, clearly says that um, parental placement may, may be found to be appropriate by a hearing officer or court, even if it does not meet Mississippi standards that apply to education, apply to education provided through MDEs and LEAs. So again, the court was erroneous, the court was, was wrong on both the law and the facts in, finding, in, in, in failing to find uh, that the, the uh, minor child was entitled uh, to uh, tuition reimbursement. Also, Your Honor, I want to note that, um, and going back to the determination of appropriate placement, in the cases that the, in the cases of Fifth Circuit jurisprudence, where the court has found that a private school placement was not appropriate, what was distinguishable, distinguishable about the facts of those cases were usually that child. Uh, uh, got an IEP in the public school where it was uh, an appropriate IEP and it may have been an issue with implementation of the IEP or, or something of that nature, but when they moved to private school, the services, accommodations they received were less. You know, they were not receiving services commensurate with their disability, you know, there was no accountability, and so in those cases, yes, the court rightfully found that that was an appropriate placement. However, Your Honor, the facts in this case, let me be clear, and the record is clear, this child in the Rankin County Public School District received zero services geared toward his dyslexia. Uh, he was he failed the kindergarten screener and failed the screener in kindergarten. He was not evaluated. He gets all the way to second grade. He's still failing, operating below, below grade level. A mom has to go out get a, a pediatri get a pediatrician. Tell you know she tell him maybe he has dyslexia. Then go pay for an independent evaluation from a specialist out of pocket, determines he has dyslexia, the school district still refuses to give him a comprehensive evaluation uh, for his uh, dyslexia. And so he receives absolutely nothing, and then he goes to a placement where he does receive services, uh, where he does receive in-class accommodations for his dyslexia, and he makes improvement. So this, this case, the facts of this case, falls under, uh, and based upon current Fifth Circuit jurisprudence, is clear, uh, uh, and nearest for uh, this uh, 
this uh, child to be able to, this parent, excuse me, in this matter, to receive, um, receive a private school tuition reimbursement for her placement of this child in New Summit as it was an appropriate placement. And of course, the district clearly violated uh, uh, FAPE uh, and his right to child fine. Also, Your Honor, I want to just say um, the if, if you look at overall Fifth Circuit IDEA jurisprudence, um, the facts of this case are the most egregious. It is my understanding that the um, this is would be the first uh, case of its kind from Mississippi, uh, from a Mississippi school district, and in, in cases where this honorable court has found for a um, violation of FAPE and have awarded comp compensatory services, particularly for compensatory services for private school uh, tuition reimbursement. Usually it was, you, those, the facts of those cases usually uh, was where a child was properly diagnosed and there was just uh, uh, um, issues with implementation of what otherwise was maybe an adequate IEP. Again, these facts are the most egregious. There was no special education services or even an evaluation for special education services uh, for this child for dyslexia, and they got absolutely nothing. And the parent was forced to pay out of pocket uh, to provide the child the services at the school district based upon its affirmative duty uh, to provide a free and appropriate public education to a child had to be able to provide. And so we believe that um, um, based upon the facts and the law, this honorable court should um, reverse the district court's ruling denying private school tuition reimbursement uh, as compensatory services in, in order uh, that the district uh, provide those uh, that private school tuition reimbursement. Unless they say that the district court relied on self-serving testimony in not accepting the proposition that New Summit provided beneficial help to the child. The court said he found it incredulous that there could be such a big shift in the grades and performance, et cetera. My question is, beyond the testimony, is there something in the record specifically from New Summit that would show precisely what the curriculum was that the child had there, et cetera? In other words, beyond somebody's testimony, since you say it was self-serving, what in here would demonstrate that the instruction at New Summit met the need here and explains the improved performance. Of course, Judge Stewart. Yes, actually, Judge Stewart, there's the testimony of his teachers and dyslexia therapists, uh, in addition to the mom, that talk about the improvement he's shown both in class as well as at home in reading and other things. Additionally, Your Honor, exhibits were provided at the due process hearing that, it, that showed his grades, the courses that uh, he was provided, the services, and what the dyslexia therapy and everything that entailed. So. That that evidence, and I, well, I know it shows the grades improve, but I guess I'm getting to what shows whatever the modality that New Summit had to deal with dyslexia that directly addressed this child's situation, not just he makes A's, B's. In other words, what shows the market, uh, you know, stringency of the curriculum, et cetera, et cetera. Aside from just a report card that says you made A's and B's. Do you understand my question? Yes, Your Honor. And, Your Honor, well, let me go back, Your Honor. So he actually, and the, this, is in the, this is also cited in the uh, Appleby's brief. Uh, he be, mom actually began providing, paying out of pocket for dyslexia services in March when he was still in the district. And even in that period of time he was receiving dyslexia services, he actually did show, and the, and the Appley's brief you know, includes this as well, actually improvement in his reading levels, you know, in, in math and reading and other levels. He didn't, of course, he still was below grade level when he left the district, but those services were continued, and he continued to demonstrate that improvement uh, uh, in his reading and other things uh, as, as well from that. So the, the, it, again, the law is clear that it has to demonstrate an educational benefit, and we believe the record uh, showed that uh, during his, with his placement in New Summit. If there's nothing further from the court, um, I stand on uh, the relief as requested uh, for compensatory education services and private uh, tuition reimbursement. Thank you, Your Honors. May it please the court. 
Good morning. My name is Kashonda Day and I represent the Rankin County School District in this matter before you. In my time before the court today, I intend to demonstrate that this court should reverse the district court's opinion, finding that the Rankin County School District failed to comply with its child fine and fate mandates and therefore plaintiff is not a prevailing party in this matter is and is not entitled to attorney's fees the school district is also requesting that this court affirm the district court's ruling that the plaintiff has not met her burden in establishing that she is entitled to compensatory services for reimbursement for the minor child's private placement at new summit first this court should find that the school district complied with state and federal law when it denied the minor child eligibility for a specific learning disability for dyslexia under the IDEA. Plaintiff's primary objection is that the district relied on a single factor, the severe discrepancy model, to determine that the minor child did not meet SOD criteria. This court should reject plaintiff's argument for two reasons. First, while it is true that the district did in fact utilize the severe discrepancy model in determining that the minor child did not have a specific learning disability, the record is clear that the district also used standardized test scores. Let me ask you so I can understand more clearly. Yes. Did the school district take the position that the child did not have dyslexia or that the dyslexia somehow didn't fit within the district's criteria for providing services? Yes, Your Honor. Which? Uh, the school district took the position that the, the minor child did not have a specific learning disability of dyslexia. The school district also took the position that the minor child did not, did not meet the district's criteria for general education dyslexia services. And that was based on the various testing, evaluation, et cetera? That yes. Um, Ms. Watson provided the district with a very comprehensive evaluation report where an outside evaluator said that the student had mild dyslexia. The district immediately, within six days upon receiving that report, convened a multidisciplinary evaluation team meeting to review that data and determine whether or not the student met criteria for an SLD dyslexia ruling. The district also took that data and used its dyslexia rubric to determine whether or not the student met criteria for dyslexia therapy in general education. To which the district court did not find persuasive. Yes, that's right. And, and, and we're. The district court, in so many words, found the child had some kind of learning difficulty, and the school district did not ascertain with the level of precision what that was, such that some kind of assistance was provided to the child. I mean, those are my words, not his, but yes. I'm trying to cut to the chase. Yes. On your position of reversing the district court's determination, you know, on that. Am I fairly stating what the district court's view of the situation was? You, you are, um, Your so, Honor. You so are where is he off track? You are absolutely correct. Um, one, the district court wholly ignored the, the school district's analysis on whether or not the student had a specific learning disability of dyslexia. Under the IDEA, dyslexia is a specific learning disability. Therefore, a student must meet criteria for a specific learning disability before that student is entitled to dyslexia services under the IDEA. 
and the the court ignored the district's analysis of that in fact i don't think the district court throughout its opinion ever referenced a specific learning disability the court just concluded that because the student was struggling academically he was entitled to dyslexia services based on this outside evaluation and a failed dyslexia screener in kindergarten I'll continue with my argument. Um, again, as I stated, plaintiff contends that the district relied on one factor in determining that the student did not have a specific learning disability, but that's simply not true. The record is replete with evidence that the district considered IEP data because the student did have an IEP for speech, language, articulation services. And so this student was a student with a disability and the ruling was speech language articulation. But the district court committed error or erred when it found that the district, that the school district did not consider more than the severe discrepancy model. And multiple school district witnesses testified to this effect. The district court also improperly rejected the district's claim that it utilized more than one measure to assess the propriety of dyslexia therapy simply because the minor child's teacher at one point asked plaintiff to share strategies that the minor child's dyslexia tutor was using so that the teacher might implement those strategies in class. The district court found that the teacher's request shows that the district did not really rely on more than one measure to determine that the minor child was not entitled to special education and related services by way of dyslexia. The district court's conclusion in this regard is clearly erroneous. The district, again, wholly ignored other measures and factors that the school district considered. At the administrative due process hearing, district employees expressed a very clear understanding of their roles and responsibility with respect to the IDEA. They also expressed a clear understanding of their obligation to consider more than the severe discrepancy model. Um, many of the, I know the the minutes from the multidisciplinary evaluation team was read into the record. Record evidence shows that the district looked at the student's IEP, the, the district, the committee considered the RTI services. The committee determined that the RTI services were working and that the student was making progress as a result of tier two interventions in math and tier three interventions in reading. Plaintiff signed the minutes from that multidisciplinary evaluation team meeting. Plaintiff also signed the 504 plan that the committee determined was appropriate with respect to the outside evaluator's contention that plaintiff, that the minor child suffered from ADHD. The minor child's teacher specifically um, reiterated that she never thought the minor child had dyslexia. The court simply cannot use her request for some of the strategies that the dyslexia tutor was using as proof that the school district only utilized one measure in determining whether or not this student was entitled to a specific learning disability by way of dyslexia. The district court again largely ignored the school district's specific learning disability analysis and never even again mentioned specific learning disability in its opinion. The district court also reversed the hearing officer's decision that the minor child did not have a specific learning disability on two incorrect premises. One, that a child who struggles academically must be evaluated for 
and are given special education and related services, and two, that an outside diagnosis of dyslexia necessarily requires the provision of special education and related services or dyslexia therapy. On de novo review, this court should reject both conclusions. Courts have confirmed that not every student who falters academically owes his difficulties to a disability. And a school district is not required to evaluate every student who struggles academically for special education and related services. The record is replete with testimony of the minor child's academic progress. Yet again, the district court's opinion contains no relevant analysis with respect to the minor child's progress. Now, the school district does not suggest that it may ignore a student's academic struggles, and that's not what happened here. The record shows consistent, proper, and reasonable use of the minor child's IEP for speech, tier two, and then tier three interventions, multiple classroom accommodations. The record is replete with testimony from the interventionist as well as the minor child's classroom teacher that she implemented multiple accommodations in her classroom setting. Additionally, including, in, in addition to providing tier two and tier three interventions, the district also implemented a supplementary literacy program entitled Level literacy and I-ready reading. Two specific reading programs fashioned to remediate the student with regard to his reading concerns. In addition... MW wasn't able to make it to third grade, so whatever y'all were doing, it wasn't efficient. Well, MW still made progress. His curriculum-based assessments show that he made progress with respect to his grade equivalent math performance, as well as his grade equivalent reading performance. In fact, his curriculum-based assessments show that he grew from a first grade math, I'm sorry, reading equivalent to a 1.9, almost a second grade reading equivalent. So he did make progress in reading. And in math, he grew an entire grade during his second grade school year. So he did, in fact, make progress. He also made academic progress outside of the curriculum-based assessments. I believe MW started his second grade year at a level J on the school district standards-based reading report card. By the end of the year, he had grown to an M. So he missed the mark for promotion by one letter. He had to achieve an N in order to be promoted to the second grade. So he missed the mark by just one letter. In addition to a specified reading program, multiple accommodations, speech services. He also received a 504 plan at that March 28th multidisciplinary evaluation team meeting to address his ADHD. Now, the record further shows that these services were successful. He made reasonable progress and the district court was wrong to simply ignore the progress that he made. It just seems that, I mean, if you go from a, an F to a D, that's progress. But like going from an F to a D is progress, but does that satisfy the responsibility of the school district? I'm, I'm, I'm asking figuratively. I mean, I hear the argument he was making, quote, progress. Yes. So if you go from an F to a D, that's progress, but if the parents are saying, well, my child still has a problem, he still can't read, he can't succeed to the next grade, et cetera, et cetera. So was the district's position that, yes, he may have still had difficulties, but as long as, quote, progress was being shown, then 
that makes erroneous as a matter of law the district court's determination that there was a fate violation? In other words, if is the only duty to show progress or that something is being done as opposed to the most appropriate thing is being done. Do you understand my question? Yes, yes, Your Honor. And, 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 and no, progress is not the only determining factor as to whether or not a school district has provided a FAPE. Certainly, the, the minor child's records as a whole, not the just- The court faulted the district for not following, not following up in certain respects. I'm just trying to you know, cut through and not following up and so forth. So what's your response that, to, to that? The school district did follow up. Um, at the beginning of his second grade year, he was receiving tier two services in reading. And once his teacher realized that although he was making progress, he needed more interventions, the tier two, he was provided tier three services in reading. And that not only included just general interventions and accommodations, but the tier three services included a specific reading program, level literacy and iReady reading to address his reading concerns. And so the district did not just sit and do nothing. The record is again replete with testimony that MW's teacher, as well as the interventionist, there was constant communication with Ms. Watson with respect to MW's performance and his progress. And so the services were provided in a co coordinated and collaborative manner. Additionally, including, with, including MW's IEP, he also received multiple individualized accommodations and interventions to address his academic progress. Um, he also experienced not only academic progress, but non-academic benefits as well. The record is, um, contains multiple testimony, specifically from MW's teacher, that he got along with his classmates. Um, the teacher testified that he never exhibited any symptoms of ADHD. He paid attention, he tried hard, he worked hard. And so those factors show that the district provided MW with the fate, even though he missed the mark for promotion just by one letter grade. With respect to the school, to the district court's finding that the school district failed to comply with its child fine mandate, if the court concludes that the minor child does not have a specific learning disability as a result of his dyslexia, it need not separately address plaintiff's claim that the district violated the IDEA's child fine provision. Nevertheless, this court has held in Krawitz in its 2018 case that a child fine violation turns on three questions. The date the child fine requirement was triggered, the date the child fine duty was ultimately satisfied, and the reasonableness of the delay between the two dates. The district court improperly found that the school district was first on notice that the minor child needed to be evaluated for special education and related services when he failed a kindergarten dyslexia, dyslexia screener. Sworn testimony in the record shows that the district did not act on the kindergarten screener because another screener was administered and the minor child passed that screener and there was no need for the minor child to be evaluated for special education and related services by way of dyslexia. Also, it's worth noting that Mississippi- Is that fact finding of you didn't actually do the test something we defer to on the district court? I know you all say you did, you just don't keep copies of it. The district court found the other way. Do we defer to that? And if not, why not? Right, so the school district is asking this court to defer to the hearing officer's finding of credibility with respect to the district witness's this testimony. pretty much redo the fact. It did, and, and the district court was incorrect 
in disregarding the hearing officers determination that the testimony of the district's witnesses was credible with respect to that second dyslexia screener case law is clear that the hearing officer who hears the law testimony who is in a position to look at the witnesses the hearing officer is in the best position to determine the credibility of the witnesses your honor just briefly the school district is respectfully requesting that the court reverse the district court's finding that the school district failed to properly evaluate the child and comply with the faith and child find mandates and affirm the district court's position that the plaintiff has not met her burden in determining in providing proof and evidence that new summit is an appropriate private placement for the minor child thank you thank you miller your honors if i may just briefly i just want to get right to it first of all the council opposites statement position of the argument of the plaintiff and the court's determination is a mischaracterization the objection is the fact the objection that the court had as we had as plaintiffs is that the district failed to undergo a comprehensive evaluation for this child to determine dyslexia and made no changes to the iep for the listening and speech that was misdiagnosed that's the crux of the faith violation so your honor um in the andrew standard of the andrew uh standard which is applied by the fifth circuit essentially says that iep must be reasonably calculated uh for a child to advance by the circumstances the court defined that as it must be reasonably calculated for the child to be able to quote advance from grade to grade it is undisputed in this case that this child was below grade level uh operating below grade level in reading math and course subjects and ended up failing uh second grade at the end of his term that's just clear one secondly your honor um the only way you can determine whether any child has this a minor child has dyslexia or any disability is through a comprehensive assessment as a matter of law uh that's the statute and then the court or this court in the case i cited in my brief krawitz by parker v galveston school district which is a 2018 fifth circuit case clearly said it was obligation of the district to provide a comprehensive evaluation the student after receiving notice of suspected disability in fact your honor it's also a matter of state law as i cited my brief it's mississippi code annotated section 37-173-92 which says quote school district shall make an initial determination of whether a student diagnosed with dyslexia is entitled to special education services under idea before proceeding to a 504 plan so it actually was mandated as a matter of federal and state law to evaluate this child your honor and despite this obfuscation of the record of all of this testing interventions all these things were done it's fairly simple if you look at the record this is roa 761 this was the testimony from the special education director annie bullock at that time i presented her with the met documentation form um council officer was right when mom got the independent evaluation saying he had dyslexia as a matter of law the district organized a met team to make a determination as to whether or not they would do a comprehensive re-evaluation of this child he already had the iep in place i presented that document to the exhibit to miss bullock she uh she testified that this is the met documentation form and where it said recommendations for team of for re-evaluation on the form it was marked quote a comprehensive assessment is not recommended at this time at the end of the day your honor that's dispositive of the court's determination of the violation of faith they did not provide the law the mandated comprehensive assessment to make the determination if my client was entitled to an iep to provide dyslexia services that was core to the court's finding and determined lawful determination that the 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 district violated his right to a free and appropriate public education uh also your honor um 
the, the other factors, the interventions that Ms. Day spoke about that was done in the classroom, the response to interventions, the other things in the classroom, again, your kind is inconsequential. If the district was going to uh, uh, carry out his affirmative duty for FAPE in this case, when the MET team confirmed, they should have, based upon federal law, but also the state statute, which I cited, determined based on the fact that he was failing, he was below grade level, they should have uh, uh, underwent a comprehensive assessment to determine, uh, uh, to, to uh, uh, give him an IEP for the dyslexia, provide those services commensurate with that, and they would have been in compliance with FAPE. They never got there. They denied it, and he was, uh, they violated his right to FAPE, and because of that violation, he is entitled to compensatory services for private school tuition because it put his mother in the position to pay for services that the district was supposed to provide him, and we request that this honorable court uh, make up for that and uh, affirm the district court's uh, holding of a violation of FAPE and child fine and reverse the court's ruling uh, denying the private school tuition a reimbursement and provide that accordingly. What's the dollar amount of the new summit? Uh, you, uh, Your Honor, let the record reflect that is not a part of the record at the time. At the time, because of the district court's ruling, we couldn't, you know, prevent, you know, the damages, get, you know, mom's receipts for a uh, new summit, but it is very substantial. But of course, if the court reverses, then, uh, since it's back in the court, then we would be able to present that. But it is uh, substantial. Thank you, counsel. We have your argument. That will conclude the arguments uh, before the court today. Court will resume tomorrow morning at 9 o'clock with Judge King instead of me on this panel.